Hello and welcome to another video here on Computer Cat Gaming. And today we're not going to be taking a look at any computer. No, because today we'll take a look at one of the world's most popular and successful gaming console in the history, the Sony PlayStation. Now, however, I will not be alone since I've invited several YouTubers to talk about some of their favorite PlayStation games. Their names are Basip Games, also known as Super Cooper, he makes great Sly Cooper in gaming content, and also Maluda Sly, another great Sly YouTuber who mainly focuses on cool Sly Cooper content. Then we got Budget Builds Official, which does amazing videos on all sort of cheap and interesting computer components. And next up we got Icebergs, which also makes high quality videos around interesting tech, such as graphics cards. So now that you know who's here, let's get started. So the Sony PlayStation got a quite interesting story. It started way back with Nintendo and the development of the Super Famicom, also known as the Super Nintendo or SNES or SNES, however you want to put it. But it was back then Sony's Ken Kutaragi was secretly working together with Nintendo without any permission from his company Sony, where he were to create the great sound chip SPC-700 for the Super Famicom. Though unfortunately for Kutaragi, the higher-ups at Sony found out about this project, and they were not happy. They threatened to fire Mr. Kutaragi, but it was the former Sony CEO Norio Oga that saw potential in the chip and instead supported the project. The project was very successful and the sound chip they had designed was a great start for the relationship between them and Nintendo. And sometime after that, Nintendo needed a way to compete with upcoming city-based consoles, which were starting to become a thing. So they reached out to Sony, which was one of the big companies that were making CD hardware. So Sony started working on a CD add-on for the Super Nintendo, which was called the Super NES CD-ROM system. And that add-on later evolved to the Nintendo PlayStation prototype, which was its own little console, featuring the ability to play SNES games through the cartridge slot on top of the console, as well as CD-based games through the built-in CD drive. And actually, this device was not too long ago discovered here on the internet, since one of the prototypes was apparently left behind by former Sony Interactive Entertainment CEO Olafur Johan Olafsson during his time at the bank company Advanta. However, in 2009, Advanta filed for bankruptcy and had to get rid of stuff through auction. It was then Terry Diebold acquired the device along with other stuff from the company. So then the Nintendo PlayStation prototype was left up in his attic for a couple of years until 2015, where it finally made its debut here on YouTube by Terry's son Dan. And if you know about the Ben Heck show, you probably know how Benjamin got it fully functioning with the disk drive and all that. Good job on him. Okay, but why didn't the Nintendo PlayStation ever come out? Well, it appeared that Nintendo wasn't very happy where this all was heading, since they realized that this cooperation was way more beneficial for Sony than for themselves, since Sony would get most of the money and Nintendo would basically only be a first party game developer for Sony, and nothing more. So Nintendo really needed to find a way out of this horrid situation that they positioned themselves in. And what did they do? Well, they teamed up with Philips instead, and we all know how that went. I hope she made lots of spaghetti! It was then the breakup was official. Right after Sony revealed the project to the public in 1991, Nintendo stated that they had no idea about this project and that they were not working together with Sony at all, but with Philips. It was then Sony felt betrayed, since Nintendo basically ruined their console that they've been working together for so long on. But that didn't stop Sony. They had a vision of a great city-based console up ahead of them, and that vision was enough for them to rethink and continue the PlayStation project. So in early 1993, they began working on their own console, 
codenamed the PlayStation. Though a lot of changes had to be made because Sony did not have permission at all to have SNES games as one of the playable formats anymore. And since the competitors were working on upcoming 3D consoles by the time, a CD-based gaming console alone with only 2D capable hardware wouldn't be that exciting since that was already available on the market with devices such as the Sega CD and the Philips CDI. So to compete, they made it relatively powerful and easy to develop for, which would be great because the upcoming Sega Saturn would be apparently really complex to make games for due to its complex dual CPU setup. And to make it even more developer friendly, they went with the CD format instead of the cartridge media, so they would be able to cut down production cost for each game. And not only did the CD medium cut the cost, but it also allowed games to include a lot more assets than previously imagined. So that opened the possibilities to pre-rendered in-game cutscenes, high quality textures and even superb CD quality soundtracks. However, the cost of the CD drive would make every PlayStation 1 unit more expensive than a console without it, but it gets cheaper in the long run due to its cheap games. I'm going to ask Sony Computer Entertainment Presidents of America, Steve Reyes, to join me for a brief presentation. But when it came to making exclusives, Sony had an issue. They did not have any in-house game studios in comparison to the competitors Sega and Nintendo. So Sony got in contact with several studios such as Naughty Dog, Namco, Konami and more which resulted in several good games which were mostly nowhere else to be bought. Then the time had come and it was December 3rd 1994 and it was the first release day for the Sony PlayStation which was set in Japan. The final specifications of the PlayStation consisted of 32-bit LSI Coreware CV33300 core which was based on the R3000 CPU and was processing at the speed of 33.33 MHz, as well as having 5 KB of L1 cache. It was also rocking a 16-bit 24-channel sound processing unit with 512 KB of memory which was great for powering CD quality audio. And it got 2 MB of EDU RAM for main memory and also 1 MB of VRAM for the frame buffer and then an additional 2 KB of texture cache. For the GPU it is capable of rendering resolutions from 256x224 to up to 640x240 with progressive scan and while being capable of 3D and 2D graphics. And when it comes to 3D it is able to process to up to around 90,000 polygons with texture mapping, lightning and grout shading and then 180,000 with just texture mapping and also 360,000 with just flat shading. The GPU is also featuring features such as an adjustable frame buffer to up to 1024x512 and also off-screen rendering, fog, colored light sourcing and much more such as transparency effects and 24-bit colors. Wow! However, it lacks some features that the Nintendo 64 would later come to have, that being anti-aliasing and floating point precision. The lack of floating point precision would result in that some 3D objects would overlap other objects which could make for some weird graphics. Budget builds will go more in depth with that later. So one of the most important things that would make the PlayStation successful was the built-in compact disk drive, which can be used for playing PlayStation game series but also as well as playing music series. The disk drive is running at a speed up to 2x, transferring up to 300 kilobytes per second and the PlayStation game series can also store up to 660 megabytes of data which is over 10 times larger than the largest N64 cartridge which would come to have 64 megabytes. So that really let developers run wild with in-game contents without worrying too much about filling the entire CD. 
And something that's very different from today's consoles is that it completely lacks internal storage. So saving game data had to be done on a PlayStation memory card, which often consisted of 15 blocks of data. Each save file usually was one block for each game, depending on like the required size. But if you were to save a lot of different saves, you could count on that it would be filled quite quickly. Though, however, since my official one broke ages ago, I've been using a third party memory card from Blaze that holds four entire memory cards that got a switch that allows me to switch between them whenever I want. It's pretty neat if I'd say so myself. Well back to the console itself and its several revisions. So since it first launched in Japan in 1994, its first version was the SCPH-1000 and notice how it ends with a zero. Well that's because that shows what region it's from, so if it ends with a zero it's from Japan and one is for USA slash Canada while two is for PAL regions such as Europe and Australia and then three for the rest of Asia. So this is good to keep in mind, since the games and the consoles are locked to their respective regions, so be careful when you import games or consoles. And also, the consoles in PAL and NTSC regions that have the same model number as the Japanese SCPH-1000 are simply as based off the SCPH-3000 series, so they miss out on the S video output that the original have. However, nothing really changed after that, except improving the CD drive well until the SCPH-5001 came out, which then removed the AV outputs, which could be a bummer for some people. And it even changed yet again, starting with the SCPH-9000 series, which removed the parallel port, which previously allowed for devices such as the GameShark slash other sheet devices. Me, myself, got a PS1 model, aka the SCPH-102, which was basically a slim model of the PlayStation, which got released just in time for its successor, the PlayStation 2. This model saw the removal of the serial port, which was used to allow linking two PlayStations together in combination with any multiplayer game that supported multiplayer across two consoles, such as Doom and several racing games such as Wipeout. But the PS1 got something all the previous models lack, and that, my friend, it's a detachable portable LCD screen, but so what, what's the point? Well, this screen allowed people to play PlayStation almost everywhere. Well, as long as they had somewhere to connect it to, since after all, it doesn't have a battery and remember, this was several years prior to the PlayStation Portable, so owning one of these must have been pretty cool. I mean, I'd like one. But moving on to the humongous game library of around 3000 titles, the PlayStation 1 got a huge variety of genres to choose from, with RPGs like Final Fantasy to The Legend of Dragoon, and platformers like Crash, Castlevania, and Klonoa, and many more. There's something for everyone. And that's what I think they wanted to achieve. Old, young, nerds, or casuals, the PlayStation is a gaming system for everyone. Me, myself? Well, when I was a kid, I was mostly into playing on our Pentium 4 or the PlayStation 2, and most of our PS1 games were rated 15 years plus, so I avoided playing them due to how my mom didn't like if we kids were playing games that were over our age group. But that didn't really stop me, because I still managed to find times where I could play my games such as South Park and Carmageddon, two games which are known for not being for kids due to their gore and language. However, due to their outdated graphics, it's now hard to take them serious, but that makes them even more fun to play today. But before I go more in depth into my small collection of 10 games, I'll let two of the four featured YouTubers share their favorite PlayStation games, and that being Icebergs and Mon Lotus Lie. The spotlight is yours, Icebergs. <laughs> Hi guys, it's Icebergs the Crazy GPU Guy, and I'm here making a little video for my boy Computer Cat Gaming, and I thought this would be pretty awesome. Now, I'm not a huge PS1 collector, and he wanted me to make a quick little video for his little video about the PS1. I just got done filming a GPU video, and I thought it'd be awesome to sit down and talk about a couple of my favorite PS1 games, even though I only have, like, five. So, let's talk about those. One of the first games I ever played on the PS1 was Real Fishing. 
This game is so bad, it is good. And there's a bunch of games for it now out on the Wii, the DS, the Vita, all kinds of random crap. Just a fun game that's terrible, but it's actually really freaking fun. I do also have a really beat up copy of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. This game doesn't really need an introduction or any specs about it. It's just an awesome game, and I'm sure everybody already knows that. So I do have a beat up copy, but that's another game I do have on PS1. Now, one of the most popular PlayStation 1 games of all time, Gran Turismo 2. I also have on the PS1. I played this so much when I was young. Like, so, so much. Getting all those licenses and getting all those cars was just so much fun back in the day. And I really, really do miss this game. But man, it looks really old when you played it. I, I just played it and it looked really, really dated. I was like, wow, I take for granted what we get these days, especially on the low end consoles like the Wii and stuff. Like, even that just completely blows this away. Even though this game is an amazing arcade racing game, or a uh, simulation game, it's just, uh, I don't know, something about it just doesn't hold up for me, even though it's an amazing game. One of my favorite PS1 games and favorite games of all time is Air Combat. I love this game. Like, I love, love, love this game. I played this so much on the PS2 because, you know, backwards compatibility, but I put so many hours into flying jets in this game. Whenever I'm playing a game like GTA V or Sky Odyssey, or Crimson Skies, I'm always reminded is how much I love air combat. And it's just a fantastic, fantastic arcade flight game, and I love it. To really learn about air combat's history, or ace combat as it's called in Japan, we have to go back to 1993 when the game was released as an arcade machine. The game ran on the first ever 3D polygon processing system called the Namco System 21. The Namco System 21 had two Motorola 68,000 CPUs running at 12.3 megahertz. The story in this game is completely forgettable and kind of irrelevant. It's all about the gameplay here. If you beat the game one time, you get a special paint job and there's a huge variety of aircraft in the game. As most of you are aware, the PS1 port actually does not look that great. In fact, it kind of looks like Minecraft to be honest. So that is super disappointing, but there was actually missing things from the game, like a takeoff landing system. It was actually added a week after the game was submitted for approval and these copies were actually only available to the programmer team. Near the game's 10 year anniversary on August 25th, 2005, Namco actually came out with an air combat for cell phones. You could download this game through the Namco service. It was a network based on the Japanese Easy Web mobile connection. And it was built on a brew mobile application that you could buy for 525 yen or about five bucks. I find this so interesting just because the arcade cabinet that it was originally designed on was pushing technology to its limit. And then 10 years later, it was on the mobile phones. That's just super cool. Even though all this happened, the game actually was shut down only a year later. So sadly, it was only available in Japan and it was shut down a year after release. So if there's any Japanese people out there, you guys should let us know if you actually played this back in the day on your phone. Thank you so much, Computer Cat, for letting me be in your video. Just pick a console I have more games for next time, will ya? I really had fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Leave a like on this kid's video and subscribe to this kid, will ya? He's an awesome dude. Alright, hope I can see you in the next one. Really nice intro and an interesting set of games. And well, I did not expect to see real fishing due to how it's not something you think about when you think about video games, but I got to say that it can be really addictive. I however have only tried the sequel Real Fishing 3 on PS2, but I expect it to be n not too different. And can't forget Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and Gran Turismo, both well known and great games. But what I really thought was cool was the port of Air Combat. I mean, I've played a fair amount of flight simulation games on PC, but considering how this advanced flight simulator was first on arcade back in around 1993 makes me real impressed, but it was also a launch title for the PlayStation in North America, which is saying something. And of course, I'll make sure that if I'll make more of these kinds of videos in the future, I'll try to pick a more current platform. Maybe the PlayStation 2? Either way, thanks for the video. And moving on, we have Maludus Light. So, the game I will talk about is not really a game that affected the PS1 as much, at least in my own opinion, like, there's games that really made a big, big impact on the PlayStation 1 saga. Pretty much, we can say, Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, you know, those games I feel like they had a major impact. Now, the game I will talk about is actually Yu-Gi-Oh! Now, there's a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! games in the PS1, but... In my opinion, the one that really sets aside the competition is Yu-Gi-Oh! 
Forbidden Memories. Now, I'm not entirely sure if you are familiar with the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise, but this game really isn't as, how can I say, connected to the series, if you know what I mean. Like, the game is its own world, pretty much, and that was something that I really enjoyed in the game. Plus, it had this... I'm not gonna say cheating, but I feel like it was cheating. Like this, instead of you actually using a fusion, because in Yu-Gi-Oh, instead of you just combining people like in Dragon Ball, basically this in Yu-Gi-Oh, you need a specific card to fuse other cards. But in this game, you just fuse them as random. And that was something that really helped me during this game. And it's something I really enjoyed as a kid, pretty much. Plus, each time you defeated the... Uh, duelist you get stars and if you actually add enough stars you can buy cards however you actually needed codes for that and at the time I was a very noob guy and I didn't know how to YouTube pretty much or internet forums so basically yeah I was screwed pretty much every single time by the last boss with that being said I can say that pretty much one last detail I really enjoyed was the fact that Kaiba in the series is like more of a rival slash ally, but in this game he was a bad guy. And that really, pretty much just that alone made me have a good time pretty much, kicking his butt. And yeah guys, that's pretty much my part. Hope you enjoy the video. Thanks for having me, Computer Cat Gaming. Now, my little slide, thanks for sharing your game. And nice that you brought up a game like Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. Not only is it an interesting game that brings variety to this video, and oh, yeah, that reminds me how I really should play my Yu-Gi-Oh! game that I own for my Game Boy Advance. I mean, I've seen my older brother play it a lot, so maybe it's time for me to jump into it. So on to my collection consisting of 10 games. And indeed, it's not a lot and it doesn't contain any games from any of the big mascots, but I've had my share of fun with them, so let's share them with you guys. I'll start things off with a game I got quite recently, and that's NHL 2000 by EA Sports. And yep, it's one of those games that comes out every year, so it's near identical to NHL 99 and NHL 2001. Still, most of you probably knows how games like NHL plays and what it's about, but if you have no idea, I'll just give you a quick summary. NHL 2000 is a hockey game which you probably already noticed by the background footage and the goal is to score as many goals in order to win. Simple stuff, right? And since you the player is the one controlling all the hockey players in your team, of course the game is viewed on a camera perspective, just as on real TV which makes it really easy to switch between players and always be centered in the action where you can either pass the hockey puck to another player or shoot in the goal which is guarded by a goalkeeper. It also has a lot of modes such as season mode, later called a franchise mode, which has features such as retirement and trade players. It also features a tournament mode where you can play against other countries where you climb to reach the finals then to win. There is also a multiplayer mode, but I didn't play it in time for this video. Next off, I got Carmageddon, created by Stainless Games and ported to PlayStation by Aqua Pacific, and this is my only racing game on this console but it's one of my all-time favorites. The point in this game is to make as much damage as possible, not on yourself though. And due to this, it's best enjoyed through split-screen multiplayer in order to see who's the best survivor or who can die first. Not only that, but it tries so hard to be brutal and gory, which actually contributes to the experience, but it's also so hard to take serious. And running over zombies is quite fun, so yeah. Though I don't really understand how Germany found killing zombies offensive, cause they replaced them with robots instead. Also I just felt the need to add this, but this is a PAL exclusive for the PS1, so sorry for the rest of the world. And strangely enough, the first version of Carmageddon, which was on MS-DOS, was actually released first in Sweden for some odd reason. And another multiplayer game I got is South Park, developed by Iguana Entertainment and ported by Apollosa Interactive. It's a multi-platform first-person shooter based on a TV series conveniently named the same thing. The PS1 version of this game is the worst one due to the short draw distances and frequent frame dips, in exception of split-screen multiplayer which is something the PC version misses out on due 
to having local network play instead. So for the single player campaign I would avoid this version, either shows the Nintendo 64 version or the PC one. Either way, it's fun for multiplayer with all the crazy weapons and allows for playing just all the different South Park characters, with examples such as Mr. Mackey, Pip and Jimbo that are unlockable in the single player campaign, or you could just unlock all of them with a simple cheat code. And well, the story, if we now can call it that. So yeah, there's a meteor crossing path with the earth, so uh, well, I'll just let Chef explain it to us. Hi, Hello, children. Did you hear the news? What news? A big comet is headed our way. It's gonna cross paths with the Earth, and when it does, all kind of crazy spooky stuff is gonna happen. Spooky like how? Spooky like you better get your asses indoors, children. I'm not kidding. Our lives are in danger! What the hell is that about? <laughs> Man, Chef is weird. Moving on, we have classic series Manual Relate with the PlayStation, and that's Tomb Raider by Core Design, which is Tomb Raider 3 now in this case. I, however, have never really gotten into this game due to how I never can get used to the controls and how unforgiving the game can be, especially in the water. Help! Help! And really, I'm not alone on this one, since I've seen many consider this the hardest one in the trilogy. So really, I've never experienced enough of the game, so I don't feel like I can fully talk about it. I better play the first two first. Another game I've not spent that much time with is Tunguska Legend of Faith by Exortus Incorporation, and it's kinda similar to Tomb Raider in a sense, and what I mean with that is that it has some really hard obstacles, but also a Tomb Raider vibe, if you get what I mean, though it feels a lot easier to control. The story is about a guy in jail that gets executed by a cop that turns out to be a demon or something, because he was framed for killing his girlfriend or someone, which he probably didn't do. And when he dies the demon chases him, so he goes into a weird portal that turns out to lead into a mysterious castle filled with dangers. Well, is it only me or does this game really need some background music? The only music I hear during my half hour recording was and that's like every time I die. Still, I like it though. And before I continue with my remaining games, I'll let Budget Bills and Bass Up share their videos. Over to Budget Bills Official. The PS1 was a console that defined another generation of gaming. Welcoming the cheap use of commercial CDs and the developer-friendly hardware, it quickly became the pathway to success for many developers. It handled both 2D and 3D games similarly, which led to the transition of highly detailed 2D games into smooth scrolling 3D worlds. But as good as many of these games were, none of them came on to spawn a legacy as detailed and lasting as Metal Gear Solid. Now in the world of today's high paced games we have to take a step back and look at what many games of the time were. Although featuring storylines and not half bad ones too, they were rather primitive. The graphics in many games, although vibrant and snappy, were failing in one area which is where the PS1 really struggled. It suffered with something called affine texture warping, where developers would have to write their own transformational code to allocate screen space to the game. The only real way to get around this would be to divide the geometry into small enough triangles. Which doesn't sound bad at all, you can divide anything into triangles and still make it detailed. But here's the issue, the PS1 had one megabyte of VRAM to work with, so you can't just divide entire segments of walls and roads and backgrounds into individual little polygons, so it's just not doable. And that's why you saw many games had warping walls and ground textures, which in many games with open world environments could lead to it looking like roads were being sucked in towards you or buildings were collapsing or popping in. It was an issue with hardware that was very difficult to overcome and extreme optimizations had to be made from the beginning of development to get around the problem. The game itself came on two CDs due to the sheer amount of content the game had available. So to begin with, the game itself had a wide array of maps separated by elevators and doorways. 
which are all accessible in a very open world kind of manner. Stealth, combat and story all merge together flawlessly with the codec calls moving forward as the story progresses. The voice acting for the game is definitely spot on, which most people can agree with, with the legendary David Hayter taking on the role of voicing Solid Snake. I won't give too many intricate details about the storyline, but you play a Solid Snake who has been pulled out of retirement in to look into the Shadow Moses incident. The storyline is not only intricate and detailed, but links to the previous Metal Gear games and leads on to the sequels in the series, playing a key part in the subsequent games. But if I delve too much into these aspects, we will be here for far too long. Graphically, the game is very impressive considering the aforementioned specs of the PS1 console, utilising the full power of the PS1 console while still reserving enough power to prevent anything that could be distracting to the player, such as frame drops. The game runs at a locked 30fps in 240p, which does sound quite jarring but on a CRT the game not only feels responsive but it looks great with true blacks that really give a stealth feel. It incorporates a sort of blur effect, so if it's needed, the dark atmosphere really does help the game due to the blur, the dark surroundings, it does feel like a very dark toned stealth game. It is often used in cutscenes which are fully rendered in the game's own engine to add dramatic effect, and the game has very cleverly detailed models which use just enough textures to maintain a very detailed appearance but allow for a fluid enough experience to prevent the affine texture warping. The unique camera system is quite advanced for the time and allows you to see clearly where the enemies are located in both third and first person. You don't have control of it and it is controlled automatically by the game engine, but it is so accurate that I can't really complain with how it works. You can use first person as well by holding down the triangle key, which proves incredibly helpful for looking into different situations when soldiers are near. The game is nothing short of flawless on the PS1 console, but did see some ports to other consoles as well. The PC received a port which appears to work well with increased graphics settings and the ability to set your own custom controls, but lacks some of the features such as the ability for Psycho Mantis, one of the bosses, to read your memory card. It also lacks the blur which aimed to add the atmosphere to the game which although not major, you will notice it a tad. The PS3 also received a port which is often regarded as being one of the best ways to experience the game. A sequel of sorts does exist called Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes which was released on the GameCube, but it features different voice actors, a lighter environment and a new engine. Fans have attempted to fit this game into the universe by saying that the game acts as a simulation to the Shadow Moses incident, and for the most part that remains true to the Metal Gear Solid storyline, but with some minor and more annoying changes. For many fans though, Metal Gear Solid remains the Mario 64 of the PS1 console. It transformed a 2D set of games into a 3D universe with fluidity and charm. It was the first PS1 game that set itself apart using all of the sound capabilities of the PS1 to the maximum it could. The storyline is captivating and unique and the gameplay was there to define the stealth genre. Good job, indeed, Metal Gear Solid is probably one of the best looking and solid PS1 games to exist. And even though it runs on the very limited hardware of the PS1, it was an impressive jump from 2D to 3D. And really, there were many 3D attempts of 2D games. And there were just a few games that actually pulled it off like Super Mario, Final Fantasy and Duke Nukem, while other games had it a bit rougher. So over to our final guest, that is Basso. I myself have always been an N64 guy, it was the first console I had ever played and it was the only console that I did play for quite some time, until I was introduced to a little game called Sly 2 Band of Thieves on the PlayStation 2, and it would be years, years before I ever lay hands on a PS1 game, actually that was last year. You see, I had recently gotten my hands on the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy for the PS4. It was a really big game that a lot of people were talking about, and I had heard of the Crash Bandicoot games before on the PlayStation 1, but never gave them a try. Needless to say, I was impressed, and I wish I had played those games all those years ago and hadn't waited so long for the Insane Trilogy. And knowing that the Spyro Trilogy was out there, which was also very critically acclaimed on the PS1, I knew that I just couldn't wait to play this trilogy, knowing that I could be missing out on something like I did with the Crash Bandicoot game. So I hopped on the PlayStation Store on the PS3 and I bought the first Spyro game. This was my first ever PlayStation 1 experience, and that was last year, I was 15 years old and had never played the PlayStation 1 before, and I know it was outdated, and I didn't grow up with these games, so I didn't have the nostalgia factor, but I was impressed with Spyro. 
I love playing the old Nintendo 64 games now, but I've got to say, one of the main reasons is because of nostalgia. I can't, I don't even know if those games are actually good anymore, just because the nostalgia is too great that I just love the games anyways. But Spyro would have to do something for me because I didn't grow up with it. And it's not to say that it was a mind-blowing or groundbreaking game because it wasn't. Maybe it was at the time, but not now. It's just plain fun. Yes, I enjoyed Crash Bandicoot, but I really, really enjoyed Spyro. I've always been a fan of more open world games, and I know Spyro's not completely open world, but it's less linear than Crash Bandicoot. And I love the setup, how it is, it's still linear, but you can choose your own paths, you can go where you want to go, and still is this linear experience. It would really be hard to blow me away for the kind of game that Spyro is, because at this point in my life, I have played so many games very similar to Spyro. But the gameplay was just fresh enough and just fun enough for me to really enjoy it. Add in some funny humor, likable characters, and the voice of Tom Kenny. I am a big Spongebob fan, so that extra bit of uh, trivia was pretty fun for me. And you got a great game. I'll probably never be a PlayStation 1 fanboy, and I never really grew up with it, but I think it's safe to say from here on out, I'm going to be giving the PlayStation 1 a lot more chances when it comes to games. I don't want to miss out on any more great games such as Spyro just because I didn't give it a try, and I think Spyro is a fantastic game, and I can't wait to play the Reignited Trilogy on PlayStation 4. Before I end this clip, I do want to thank Computer Cat Gaming for including me in this project. It's a lot of fun to do and actually go back and play Spyro again for this video. So thank you so much, and I hope everybody who watched enjoyed. Anyways, I've been Basib. Peace. Exciting. A PlayStation mascot. Just what we needed. So, I think we're in the same boat here, Basib. Since we grew up after the PS1, we'll miss out on many great games which aren't as popular today but were in the past. So that's why new releases such as new titles or remakes are great for bringing back old series, due to new publicity they get. Crash for example was swiped under the rug for quite some time, but got revived recently with the Insane Trilogy that was released just last year on the PS4 and now this year as a mold platform title. And now the same will happen to Spyro, which seems to be looking pretty good so far. Either way, thanks for contributing to this video. And now down to my final 5 games. First we have Star Wars The Phantom Menace, developed by Big Ape Productions. A game adaptation of the movie which I to be honest did not plan to buy. It just simply happened, I swear. It was kinda like the Trojan horse, cause really I bought The Simpsons Hit and Run at a flea market for the PS2, but then when I came home to play it, well, then it wasn't what I was expecting. So I still gave it the chance. But it stopped when I came to this point. Moving on I got Xena the Warrior Princess by Universal Studios Digital Arts and really it exceeded my expectations. Like really I never liked the TV show but this game was quite fun. It's an action hack and slash game with platforming and puzzle elements, which reminds me of the 3D Zeldas, but more linear. Also, I don't remember the story, but it was something about saving some Gabriella or something. You know, this guy. Either way, I don't find the story necessary for this game to find it enjoyable. The gameplay makes up for it in almost every way, with the detailed worlds and intense fighting as well as several different mechanics in order to progress and find secrets. Next off, I got Wild 9, a 2.5D platformer from the developers of Earthworm Jim, if you can remember him. And well, in this game, you're Wix, a earthling in an unfamiliar galaxy in a group called the Wild 9, on a mission to save the other members from the big bad guy named Karn. So Wix got this weapon called the Rig, which can be used to move around and throw objects and enemies, or simply as tortured enemies. It can also be used as a grappling tool in certain places in order to progress. It's quite an enjoyable game, but can really drag on with its long levels, with tons of enemies, so running out of lives isn't too hard. Still, it's a fun game. And let me just conjure this one. <clears throat> Super califragilistic Xyalodocious. Yes, it is Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, developed by Argonaut Games. 
Though this version is Swedish, so hence why it's named Harry Potter och det visar sten instead. EA, however, didn't bother to have English language as an option, so yeah, there's that. Well, what you can imagine, it's a game adaptation of the book slash film with the same name. So if you probably have not seen the movie or read the book yet, then you must have been living under a rock for the past 20 years. Either way, Harry Potter is the main character in this series and he's a miserable kid living at his uncle's family due to how his parents died when he was very young. However, one day, he gets a mysterious letter from the wizarding school Hogwarts, well, several letters, that wants him to start studying wizardry and witchcraft. So he goes there without his uncle's consent, and he meets both friends and fiends, as well as stumbling into a lot of troubles and mysteries. So while this game is not great in all aspects such as graphics, voice acting and design, it's a fun game which everyone who has a PS1 and likes Harry Potter should try. And my final game I own on PlayStation 1 and will share with you guys is Croc Legend of the Gobos from Argonaut Software. And what's fascinating about this game is that it actually was planned to have Joshi as the main star. Yes, Joshi, this guy. But Nintendo did not approve on letting Argonaut Software develop a 3D Yoshi game, even considering how well Star Fox slash Starwing on the SNES went, which Argonaut programmed. It could very well be because of the Philips incident, who knows really. I wonder what's for dinner. So what about the game? Well you're a crocodile named Croc, who's on a quest to travel through five worlds in order to save his adoptive family, the Gobos, from the evil Baron Dante. And I gotta say, who named all these levels? They got very, let's say, interesting names like Be really careful. I know him so well. Life's a beach. And Defito Burrito. And well, away from that and onto the gameplay. So it's so that Croc suffers from the early 3D syndrome, which can make him a little clunky to control, and that can make it a little tad difficult. But it's something you can get used to, so it's not that big of a problem. Also, the environments you go through in this game are both colorful and vibrant, varying from the standard grass theme, caves, underwater, ice levels, and more. And one last thing. On my copy of the game, when running on my PS1, strangely can load corrupted save file which Crook recognizes as a 255% completed game. And when I found this a few years ago, my mind was blown. Like, I hadn't completed the game at all by the time, so achieving 255% by doing absolutely nothing was quite strange, weird, yet very cool. And that's all my games I got on this lovely platform. And it was really cool having over all these amazing YouTubers, which I thank greatly for participating in this collab video. So to everyone who watched this video, what's your PlayStation 1 games? And what's your favorites? Also, what type of the PS1 do you have? Or do you just play it on PS2 or the newer consoles? Let us know down in the comments. And we also gotta thank History for turning out the way it did, because this could have never happened actually. And it was really cool seeing this new console manage to sell 102 million units on its first try and even be around even when the PS3 was just around the corner. So long live the PlayStation 1's legacy and thanks for watching everyone, bye bye.